Is the market saturated? I'm glad you asked. In fact, many of you ask me all the time this question, and it's a valid concern. When I went back to school, I actually didn't even think about this. Not until I asked a physician to write me a reference letter and he said, oh, that market's saturated. Are you really sure you wanna do this? And I went, I don't know, is it saturated? I mean, I'm already emotionally invested in school, but oh my gosh, what if I get out of school and I can't find a job? And it so stressed me out and created so much fear and doubt in my plan. And then I went out and scoured the net and went through as much research as I could to find out what the job market was like. And, you know, it's hard to wanna to start school on a foundation of fear. So I'm here to give you some information that will hopefully shed some light on this and give you a stronger foundation for which to make your decision because there is some factual information out there that can help you with this. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you in this video about the current state of the job market, the future state of the job market, and your individualized market, which is gonna vary based on your goals. In addition to that, I have some tips to help you find your dream job. So stick around. This is what we're going to talk about. If we haven't met yet, my name's Bree. I'm an acute care nurse practitioner and I work in an ICU setting here in Georgia. So the current state of the job market. You want to know if you graduate today, will there be a job for you? Well, to understand this, you kind of have to have a broader perspective. We need to look at the national trends in healthcare, and you'd be living under a rock if you don't realize that there is a huge shortage of physicians. To be specific, the National Center for Workforce Analysis predicts that we will be short by 20,000 physicians in primary care by 2025. That is 20,000 holes that we can fill, people. And there's tons of data to support the fact that we are more cost effective and can be just as clinically efficient as our MD partners. I'm not saying we would replace them. Doctors, if y'all are watching this, I love and respect you so much. I would never wanna go through what you went through in your training. And I, we need you, we love you, we don't wanna replace you. We want to augment you, we want to help your practice. We want to provide a need to people that need to have access to health care. There is a definite lack of access to health care in small towns. It is hard to recruit and retain medical providers in small towns. Um, in 1997, Medicare directed funds through legislation developing critical access hospitals. So not just primary care. So if you want to be an FNP or any kind of primary care, for sure, and you don't mind working in a rural area, you won't have any problems finding a job. Um, if you want to work in a hospital in a small town, you probably won't have any problems finding that as well because there's such a need in those areas and that's where those holes really live. Another super simple way to find out what the current state of affairs is, is just to go on one of the job search engines. On Indeed, there were 251 NP jobs today. On Monster, there were 148 NP jobs. Granted, this is across all specialties and you have to practice within your lane with what you're certified to do. So it's gonna filter down depending on your niche and it's gonna vary based on what you're doing. There are significantly more FNP roles out there available than there are acute care roles. There are a lot of psych NP jobs out there and that's actually a very high paying field too. So if you have any inclination to do that, maybe you should do that. Um, so a lot of it is gonna depend on what you wanna do as to what your market looks like. Okay, so that's the current state of the job market, but what's probably the most important thing to consider is what's the future state of the job market. Because while there may not be a ton of job openings for what you wanna do right now, there very well may be plenty of them in the future. So I, I think this is a valuable resource for everybody, ju not just nurses and NPs, but the US Bureau for Labor Statistics has a website. They use data collected from occupational employment statistics to project staffing shortages. Um, this includes the current job openings and the projected job openings to derive percentage of growth. And it lists them out in so many different formats. Um, one of the ways in which you can look at this information is a listing from the fastest growing professions down. So NPs and PAs are number five and six. That's, and that's national, that's US statistics, that's huge. So NPs are number six, PAs are number five. NPs, 36% growth predicted between 2016 and 2026. That is a massive amount of growth. So even though there may not be a job for you right now, 
by the time you finish with school, there very well may be. I mean, this is only going to get worse. As we've seen in this pandemic state, healthcare is not going away. You are secure in your work in healthcare. Now, there have been, you know, a lot of talk about furloughs for people in the medical industry, and that is true. Many of my friends who work in or around OR have been furloughed because elective stuff has been shut down. So I know that many, many people are not working right now, but it's very situational and it will pick back up and they will be way behind when things get going again. So there's always gonna be a need for healthcare providers. And while there are plenty of physicians out there, I've already demonstrated there's a shortage of them. So that's your national growth. Then you can also look at your regional growth. So I live in Georgia. The Georgia Department of Labor um, anticipates there will be how many? 5,350 NP jobs in the state of Georgia by 2024. Now they use predictive models for this. Obviously this is a prediction, but it's based on the trends, um, how many jobs are added daily, what the shortages are looking like. So the individual aspects you have to consider are your region, what's available in the area where you live and are you willing to move? That's a big piece of it. If you're not willing to move, you may be narrowing down your options. The second thing you need to consider before you go back to school is are you set on your specialty or would you be willing to do something like psychiatric NP or FNP where you're gonna have more options available to you? One of the things I do wanna say about specialty is for the acute care versus family nurse practitioner thing, there are fewer jobs within the acute care subspecialties. You know, what I mean by that is you can go back to school and get your acute care NP and you can practice in a hospital or a specialty clinic. But if you are dead set on, I want to be an orthopedist, there may be less for you. If you are dead set on, I want to be a critical care provider, well, that in my region where, where I live, those jobs are kind of harder to come by as well. So you may have to work for a little while in a specialty that maybe isn't your top choice. Or you may have to move somewhere where you can find that job, take less preferable hours and work at night. One of those three factors has gotta give. The third piece that's gonna vary for you is what you need your salary to be. You know, that may, that may limit your choice. I would say that the range for NP salary is kind of all set within a, I don't know, 30 to 50,000 range. So it's, there is some variability to it, and if you're the outliers, there can be significant variability to it, but for the most part, everybody kind of falls somewhere in the same range. So definitely look into that before you go back to school, but that may be a factor for what you choose and whether or not there will be a market for you. The other piece that's gonna affect how many jobs are available to you is your preferred shift. Are you looking for shift work, nights, days? Are you looking for a five day a week, no call? Those things are going to you know, narrow down your options. So that is an individualized factor that will affect how many jobs you can find for what you're looking to do. I will say as an NP, there are definitely fewer jobs than there are as a nurse. When you're a nurse, you can kinda, the world is your oyster and you can kinda walk into a lot of different things. You may have to pay your dues in med surge for a little while, but you, you can pretty much do whatever you wanna do. There's always a need for nurses. It's a little bit less so for NPs, but it's still a big need. We still fill a vital role. There are still jobs. I promise you there still are. Don't let people tell you that the market is saturated and that be your deciding factor not to go back to school. You know, you need to think about what your motivations are. Is this something you really want to do? Are you completely over the bedside and you are ready to advance your practice? Just do it. When I went back to school, I had those kind of fears and I was a little bit afraid of it too. It was a leap of faith. I took it, it paid off. I think it can for you too. And I think we should support each other in this profession. I think there are too many of us trying to bring each other down because we're, I don't know, because we're either jealous of each other or we feel bad because someone else is succeeding and we're not, but we should support each other. We should build each other up. Okay, so moving on to three solid gold tips to help you find that dream job. I think these are very, very important. So school, school choice may be the number one factor in whether or not you get that job or not, whether or not you're marketable for that job. There's a big difference between your undergraduate program and your graduate program on your resume and how it's preparing you to work. So I have a separate video that I'm working on preparing regarding that where we'll talk in depth about it. 
But if you're getting your ASN or BSN, don't spend a ton of money on school. Go to the school that's convenient for you and your life choices and fits your financial budget, but don't spend a ton of money on it because there's a huge shortage for nurses and there's no reason in this day and age, there's so many schools that provide nursing programs that you should be in massive debt to function as an RN. You're gonna learn most of what you need to know on the job. It's different in your graduate program, okay? It's a much more competitive market and the way that you are prepared varies vastly between these programs. One of the organizations I did clinicals for told me flat out if they received a resume from particular programs, I won't name names on here, they would just throw it out. They would not even look any further. They didn't care how much experience they had. They did not want anybody from these set schools. So do your research on your programs. They need to have a very good reputation. It matters a lot where you go to school. And also in what they, how they prepare you. A huge benefit of going to a, sort of a more renowned school is that you get access to some phenomenal clinical sites. Much of what you learn and how you function, at least in the first year of your practice, is derived from your clinicals. And hiring organizations know this. So pick a good school for your graduate program. You're probably gonna have to spend more money, but would it not be awful to, to get a value degree, $20,000 value degree? I don't even, numbers are irrelevant, but a value school may not lend itself towards getting you a job. Now, obviously there are factors that play into this. If you already have something set up and arranged for you, it's different. So please don't take this as specific for everyone. It's a broad generalization. In my opinion, you need to go to a very well-renowned school for your graduate program. That's a big factor. My second tip is to market yourself. When I was in school, they forced us to develop an elevator speech and it was really hard. Just Google it. Elevator speech is basically a one minute sales pitch. It's something that you develop that describes you and what you do and how you can provide value to someone's practice. It would be something that you would share with the hiring person where you stuck on an elevator with them for a minute. That's what it is. If you develop this early on in your education, then when you're in clinical sites, you can pitch yourself. And that leads to my third tip, which is clinicals. Okay. So I have a whole another video that I'm creating on how I got five job offers from my clinicals. Um, this is an extended job interview and you should treat it as such. Yes, it's learning time for you. Yes, this is your education, but in many ways, people that are inviting students into their practice are there to have you, to see how you interact with their group, to see how you practice as a practitioner and whether or not they would want to hire you. This is huge, you guys. So be sure to check out that video, but that is my third tip invest time in your clinicals. Be a good steward of your time with this person who is taking on the burden of having a student with them and make good use of it and use your elevator speech to sell yourself. In summary, I know that you all are scared. I know you all have fears and they are rational fears about whether or not you will be able to find something when you get out of school. I had the same fears, but please know that there are jobs currently there will be more jobs in the future. We have a vital role to fill as nurse practitioners. And if this is what you wanna do, if this is your goal, if this is your dream, just do it. Don't let those naysayers keep you from doing it. Yes, there's a little bit of a leap of faith there. Yes, you may not get your dream job straight out the gate. You're gonna to have to sacrifice something, but there is a place for you. So put those fears aside, be confident, just go focus on your school and your boards, get it done and go get that dream job.